Please pray with me. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome, uh, wherever you're tuning in from right now. I, I'm really glad that you can be a part of our digital service here at Trinity Episcopal Church in Upperville, Virginia. Now, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Father Jonathan and the staff here at Trinity, Trinity were kind enough to let me go gallivanting in the UK for a couple of weeks. Uh, and I was mostly in Wales and, and then in northern Scotland for my time there. Uh, and when I was in the UK, I, I was driving um, to get from place to place around, around the country. And so I paid a lot more attention to uh, road signs and uh, various things like that because I was driving as opposed to being a passenger or taking a bus. Uh, and I love the British turn of phrase. Uh, and one point example was in America, we call the roads we leave the highway uh, by, we call them exit ramps. Uh, whereas uh, uh, in the UK, they call them slip roads. Uh, and there was just something both very interesting and amusing to me uh, in the differences of how we use the English language. Uh, and for those of you who have spent time in the UK or perhaps uh, hail from the UK somewhere yourself, uh, you may feel very similarly uh, to us as Americans. Well, there was one sign in particular that I saw when I was filling up at a gas station uh, and the sign was a caution sign that we might see here again in the United States, but the wording was a little different. The sign said, petroleum spirit, highly flammable. And I had a good chuckle to myself when I saw that, and I said, aha, that's probably going to be my next homily. Because if you change just one word in that phrase, you have a great message about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is highly flammable. And that is what we celebrate today on the church's feast day of Pentecost. Here in our church uh, at Trinity on the south side of the sanctuary, one of the stained glass windows depicts that day of Pentecost when, as the apostles and disciples were waiting in Jerusalem per Jesus' command, when they were waiting in Jerusalem and devoting themselves to prayer, the Holy Spirit rushed in powerfully like the sound of a mighty wind and fell upon them in divided tongues of fire. The Holy Spirit came in the birth of the church with tongues of fire that rested above the apostles' heads. And it wasn't just the spiritual wonder of the moment, but it was also the reality of how the Holy Spirit empowered those first believers in Jesus and inflamed their hearts to love Christ and to fulfill his calling in their lives. So all that being said, as we come to this day of Pentecost, I, I want to think through uh, with us uh, two, two questions. And certainly there's always more, but for right now, just, just two questions. And they're big enough uh, as I think it is. Question number one, who then is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Simply enough, the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune God. Now, Jesus in the Gospels, and particularly in John's Gospel from about chapter 14 to 16, uh, talks about the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And, and Jesus, uh, in the Greek, uses this word that can be translated with a multiplicity of words in English, but essentially Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the advocate, the helper, the intercessor. 
Jesus tells his disciples that after his death and resurrection, then he's going to ascend back up to the Father in heaven. And yet Jesus told his followers that he wasn't going to leave them alone. He wasn't going to abandon them. Nor does Jesus abandon us. God the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to the church, and the Spirit is still here. And the Spirit is for you, and the Spirit is for me. In Jesus' words, the Holy Spirit is our advocate, is our helper, is our intercessor. Now, as we think about who the Holy Spirit is, it's helpful to think through this question with the Nicene Creed as a helpful guide. And when we do that, we are prayerfully thinking through this question of who the Holy Spirit is, not just by ourselves, but also with all Christians across time and space. In the Nicene Creed, which we say every Sunday, we state in the third section or stanza, if you will, we say, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son, he is worshipped and glorified. And so this part of the Nicene Creed guides us and helps us understand the Christian belief in the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune God. The Holy Spirit is differentiated from God the Father and God the Son, and yet all three are inseparable from the other. They are worshiped and glorified together. Three persons, one being. It is the mystery of the Trinity that we confess as Christians. God showed up in human history in the person of Jesus nearly 2,000 years ago. He lived, died, rose again, and then ascended into heaven where Jesus still is today. But Jesus didn't leave us alone. He and the Father sent the Holy Spirit to be with the church shortly after Jesus' ascension to the Father. Those real events in Jesus' life in the day of Pentecost rewrote the rules of how we should talk about God, and that is why we as Christians confess this doctrine of the Trinity. Now, as I talk about the Holy Spirit and the Trinity, perhaps I would be a bit of a fool if I thought I could go on much further explaining this mystery, and if I thought I could say anything authoritatively uh, on my own account about the triune nature of God. But I do think it is important to say, as other Christians themselves have said, that in the Trinitarian nature of God, there is this interwoven and inseparably connected relationship between the three persons of the Trinity. And this interwoven and interconnected relationship of three persons and one God, one God and three persons, this inner relationship of the Trinity is marked by self-giving intimacy, joy, and love. And that, when we have the eyes and the hearts to see it, that overflows into everything God has created, that kind of love and connection that God has within God's very self between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, that love marks all that God has created. So continuing on with the Nicene Creed, the, the next part of the Creed says that He, the Holy Spirit, has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now, again, there's always a lot more to be said, but one of the key takeaways here is that the Holy Spirit unites us as believers, as Christians. The Holy Spirit unites those who believe in the true and living God. And so there's this connection even with the life and faith of Israel through whom the church came. 
and the Spirit speaking through the Israelite prophets, pointing both to the very heart of God in their day and time, and also pointing to the coming of the Messiah and the Savior in Jesus, and also, again, to speaking about the life of the world to come. That same Spirit lives and dwells in the church, and as we heard echoed in our reading from Acts today, Uh, we were told through the prophet Joel that in the last days, in the latter days, and that God would send out his spirit upon all people, all of his people, and the spirit would be in our hearts. And so the Holy Spirit unites believers in God, and the Holy Spirit dwells in the church in a way that connects us as believers in Jesus across space and time. And so that's part of the idea behind the communion of saints and how we're connected both here on earth and heaven because the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God, dwells in us. The Holy Spirit is God in us that connects us both to God and to one another. Okay, that's my attempt at this first question of who is the Holy Spirit? The second question that I want to consider with you this morning is how then do we experience the Holy Spirit? The apostles and disciples of the very early church experienced the Holy Spirit in a dramatic way on that first day of Pentecost. And yet the Spirit's work and activity in the church did not stop on that day, rather it was just the beginning. And again, there's so much more to be said, and there's even differing Christian perspectives on how we experience the Spirit, but I I think some of the key takeaways to share this morning is that we experience the Spirit in prayer and worship. And so when we come and gather and worship each week, the Holy Spirit shows up in our time here as we make our prayers and supplications to God. And in two particular ways, we see this in our liturgy. So during the Eucharistic prayer, there is a part of the prayer called the epiclesis where the celebrant or the priest prays that the Holy Spirit would come and bless and sanctify these gifts of bread and wine that they might be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so there is an interaction of the Spirit coming and descending upon that Eucharistic altar or table, and being with us in Christ's real presence in the bread and the wine. The second way that we hear the Spirit in our prayers and worships is at the very end, when again the priest offers a blessing to the congregation, and the priest blesses us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Another way that we experience the Spirit is through the sacraments, through baptism and confirmation. In those saving sacraments, we are given the free gift of the Spirit. It's nothing we earn, but God's Spirit is given to us in those sacramental acts. Baptism, as we pass through those uh, initial waters of forgiveness of our sins and being rooted in a covenant relationship with God, And then in confirmation, which here at church we have coming up in just a week, in confirmation, the bishop then lays hands on people getting confirmed. And the bishop is the sign of apostolic, uh, he's a sign of the apostolic connection to the early church and even this day of Pentecost. And so when the bishop lays hands on people getting confirmed and prays that they would be strengthened in the spirit, that is another way we experience the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, there are other ways that we experience the Spirit, and and one of those chiefly is faith. When faith is joined to those sacraments, when faith comes out of those sacraments, we find ourselves connected to the Spirit. And whether we experience the Holy Spirit right in that moment of baptism or confirmation, or whether it's even perhaps before those moments, or perhaps after those moments, still are subjective experience of the Spirit is rooted in those objective sacramental moments in which God is making his seal and doing something real in our lives and parting his grace to us through the Spirit. Now, we also 
experience the Holy Spirit through our prayer lives. And there's a, uh, uh, a consideration that if we would want to experience more of the Spirit's presence in our lives, that we create that opening in our own lives through times of prayer and silence and reading scripture and meditating on it in community with one another uh, and perhaps going and serving people, um, serving the poor. Uh, It's not all just esoteric in how we experience the spirit, but it's also in lived action. Um, And you all probably know all of that already and, and certainly I should Uh, or I want to be reading uh, the Bible more, praying through it more, praying in general more. Um, And so that's not so much as a stick to beat over anybody's head. Other, uh, rather, it's an invitation to go deeper, and and that is there. And we also need each other in that journey. One last thing I'll say about how we experience the Spirit, and I think this is a very clear way we see in Scripture, particularly from the book of Galatians, is that we experience the Spirit when there's an overflow of the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. And the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And those fruits overflow not through our striving or through our effort, but because of the Spirit's presence in our hearts, uh, in our lives, in our soul. Uh, and that's a very clear mark of how we experience the Spirit. And, and one of the ways we can grow in our experience of the Holy Spirit, both individually and corporately as a church, is to pray for a deepening of those fruits in our lives, that we would have more of this love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. And I believe God will answer that prayer for us. So, There's a lot more to be said, but I'll end by saying this. Just like God's salvation for us, the Spirit is God's gift in our lives, individually and corporately. And the Spirit helps us live out and realize that promise of salvation in this world as we wait for the fullness of the world to come. And so along with myself, I encourage you and us to pray for a deepening of the Spirit in our lives, both as individuals and as a church. The presence and deepening of the Spirit in your life not only changes you, but it also changes me. It changes us together because God never saves us alone, but he saves us together in the church. And so the sign that day from the gas station in England, or Scotland particularly, that sign about petroleum spirit highly flammable, that sign wasn't too far off because the Holy Spirit is highly flammable in the best of sense, and the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live out both Jesus' call and love in our lives. Amen.